Okay, we have one coat of primer. That might be all it takes, actually. It covered really well. I'm still learning on uh, using enamels, how much mineral spirits to use to thin, and I'm getting a little better every day, but every now and then it seems like it's a little bit of luck as to whether or not you get a really good, nice coverage, or, uh, or if you struggle and fight with the airbrush a little bit. Forgot to mask the headlight lenses, so I took some mineral spirits and a Q-tip and cleaned those off. Hopefully I'll remember to mask them with uh, some plastic safe grease or something else before I do the enchantment blue. So now the added parts like the door and the spark arresters no longer jump out as bright white plastic. And the putty no longer visible. Actually, I mean, this is really the true evidence that that detail removal tool really is a time saver. Um, on the F7s, when I was doing manipulation of details, I was just using a chisel point X-Acto knife and uh, took a lot more putty, a lot more sanding. This went very, very smoothly. Oops. It's still wet, so I don't want to touch it. So now, it is winter, and you probably just heard the furnace turn on, so as a result, basement is not quite as warm as it would be, although it's very dry, so we'll see. Enamel is also fickle as to when it decides to cure. Sometimes it does in about 72 hours, sometimes it takes two weeks, and uh, so we'll set this aside, and I will move on to getting the frame set up for the remotoring, adding the ground lights, and just doing other uh, modifications to the frame and chassis. While I wait for the primer to cure, what I'll do, and as I mentioned, sometimes it takes a while with enamels, um, so what I'm going to do is start working on the frame and chassis. So I have removed the speaker and the Keep Alive as I may have mentioned, I'll probably switch. Um, well, there's plenty of room for an oval speaker in a blue box. Um, I haven't had the greatest luck with uh, sound quality from oval speakers. I don't know if it's just because they're not symmetrical. Um, but uh, what I'm going to try is I've picked up some iPhone 4 speakers. So I'm going to try one of those, I think, on this model. Um, so the Keep Alive will get reused. I will probably unsolder these or just clip them off. Um, the, the purple wires for the speaker and that will get reused. The wiring harness, um, as I mentioned previously, I have a new one of those so we'll deal with that uh, just by simply replacing it. I had done a couple different things. Um, again, this was the first locomotive that I put a decoder in about four and a half years ago. So I've made a couple improvements to how I handle that. First thing is this wire that's basically jumping between the two uh, truck contacts for the right side trucks uh, is too heavy of a gauge and it's actually a solid wire so eventually you know moving back and forth that'll snap off um, I've since gone to using uh, normal 30 or 32 gauge I can never remember what it is um, decoder wire so I'll use a much finer stranded wire to jump these together uh, as you may have seen on the F7 projects I've also gone to soldering a jumper from the other side frame to a screw that I've tapped and threaded into the frame at both ends um, just to make sure we have good continuity uh, all the way through. Not that the Keep Alive does a great job, but um, you know, why not uh, take every precaution to make sure that the locomotive is going to function properly. Also I need to do these couplers are a little high and slightly uh, not horizontal. So I will uh, work on grounding those. I'll get my coupler gauge out and we'll see what I need to do to ground the frame down. Um, probably just use a Dremel motor tool to do that. And as I said, we're going to repower this with a uh, Northwest Short Lines uh, 163-4 DC motor. It comes with the two flywheels. That's what I used uh, to repower the, G the other GP7. So uh, we'll get started uh, taking the... Uh, motor out of this and uh, believe it or not I actually these are new 
these were new four and a half years ago and they're already yellowed and a little bit uh, rigid so probably not the best material that Athern selected to make those out of I don't know if it's the Lavelle grease or whatever that doesn't play well with that but we'll chuck those and what I did for the first GP7 and I'll probably have to grind some of the frame here uh, to make some space for the new motor I'll probably repeat what I did with the other GP7 uh, and as far as a motor mount uh, area in the fuel tank what I did there was cast some resin in this void and inserted some lead shot while I was casting the resin just to create both a weight as well as a nice flat uh, motor mount area uh, for the new Northwest, Northwest Short Lines. So I'll probably do the same thing there. Uh, these side frames, I have a whole bunch of side frames. Uh, I'm not really happy with how I put these side frames together so these will probably get thrown back in the parts bin and I'll grab a new set and uh, glue those up, put the brake hoses on, speed recorder cable and things of that nature. Um, so we'll keep going with the disassembly. I'm probably just going to cut some of them. Well, and we'll see. I'll cut them now. I can always desolder that later. Let's get this off of there. This big thick wire is going in the garbage because I'm not going to use that for anything. This. This has all that black electrical tape residue on it, so I'm probably just going to, for <laughs> what I said, it was three bucks for a new one. I'm just going to chuck the old one. i got enough junk floating around my workbench. I'm starting to try and get a little bit more discerning as to what I keep and don't keep. The notion of keeping everything just creates more clutter than I need. Fine screwdriver. off. Hmm. Before I do that, you know what? I should get my coupler height gauge and I'll set this up on that to make sure that I know what I need to remove from the frame at that coupler mount so that the draft gear can get set at the right height. Um, but you'll notice one of the reasons I do the jumper cables, I try not to over lubricate. Maybe I, maybe I do over lubricate the uh, bearings and wear surfaces on the motors, but you can see, maybe you can see, the top of this surface on the truck has some oil on it. Hasn't been a problem because the Keep Alive does a great job, but uh, yeah, I wonder just how much contact I'm losing out on because those, those surfaces have uh, oil on them. So that's why on all of the more recent locomotives I've been doing, and again, this is my last Blue Box 2 redo, so it's really kind of a moot point, I guess, I guess uh, now, but as I go through them again, I may go back and touch some of the other ones up. I am going to do jumpers uh, to make sure that we just don't lose any opportunity for contact. All right, so let me go grab my coupler height gauge, which is actually attached to my programming track, which is up next to my computer. So I will be back. All right, these actually aren't too far off. The coupler heights aren't. Um, just in both cases, when I ground these down, again, that might have happened when I was uh, in my early teens, that the uh, I didn't grind them parallel with the, the top of the frame. So they're both kind of canted or leaning outward, um, which makes them low. So I think if I grind the back to level that out, that should, uh, that should rectify that. So we will work to do that in a little bit. those aside. <clears throat> this little metal piece doesn't really hurt anything but I generally remove it. It used to be where the light attached. And if I'm going to fill up this whole cavity with casting resin, take the little shim out of there, I can take the electrical tape off. And I will clean all of that um, 
with rubbing alcohol before I cast just to make sure it's clean. Although the, the resin will grab in these, uh, in these holes because I'll just mask them at the base. And what I did previously, that seemed to work pretty well. Now I gotta see if I have any casting resin left. But I also need to test fit the motor to see where that's gonna set up relative to the trucks and the uh, other parts of the frame. It doesn't appear that I have any casting resin left. I'll have to buy some more. The stuff I had started to uh, just have some cloudy imperfections to it, so I think it was just getting old. Which would have been fine for what I'm doing now, so sometimes keeping stuff is good, I guess. You never can tell. Best I can tell with the Northwest Shortline motors is essentially the only difference in these Blue Box repower kits is the size of the flywheels. If you have a, a wide body like this old GP7, the flywheels match the or slightly smaller than the width. If you order the one for narrow bodies, the flywheels are just smaller and match the narrow width of the motor. So uh, in this particular case, I can attach the motor laying on its side rather than having to do it vertically. So I just need to figure out how much in order to center these. material just along that, that line. And whenever I grind I usually try and prepare you know I'll get all of my gears and electronics away so that when I grind I'm not creating <laughs> grit into those because that would probably really reduce the uh, longevity of those items. But you can see just how much <laughs> longer. I guess it's about the same when you figure you got the uh, commutator in there. But I'm very happy with the Northwest Short Lines motors. The Mashima cam motors are, are nice too. Evidently, those might be at the end of their run. I guess I thought I saw somewhere that the magnet supplier has notified them that they can no longer provide magnets. So that would be uh, unfortunate because I think Mashima cam motors have been benefit to us for a long time. Right, I'm going to take the couplers off as well so I can grind those at the same time. I think I used self-tapping screws way back when I did this because I did not have a 256 tap which I've been using quite a bit. That's definitely beneficial tool to have if you don't have a 256 tap I would recommend it I use it constantly Let's see if I can re-tap this depending on what size it is or if we'll have to keep using those or just reuse those self-tapping screws let's see what size yeah it's way too large for my 256 tap so we will have to reuse the existing screws which will be fine all right, now let's get all my motors out of the way. Get the trucks out of the way. I need a container for all this. I might just put all the parts for this locomotive in there. grab iron that I did not use. <clears throat> I can probably throw this away. My former 
my former decoder mount, which was <laughs> less than ideal. So all I did was lay back this squared up part to be even with this uh, kind of diagonal piece. I'll do it on the other side and then we'll test fit again and then I will try and vacuum up all of these chips. Sorry, I keep kicking that. This does take a little bit more effort and time to try and record than it does just to do the work. So I apologize for the rough nature of this. <clears throat> yeah, now the frame is basically the same height all the way around, so I have plenty of freedom to maneuver the motor however I choose. So I think that's probably satisfactory in terms of grinding the frame for the motor. <clears throat> I might change the bit to try and maybe use a... I don't know. Yeah, I might change what I'm using on the Dremel for this. a little bit better than it was. They were really not level before. Course file does a lot faster work, but I'm going to use a finer one here just to smooth out the finish here. Yeah, it did a lot better on the one than I did the other. making a mess. <clears throat> a couple more projects to do here. We have I need to 
drill right about here and here for the ground lights. That's about centered underneath the cab. Um, I assume that that's where they are. I should probably check the photographs to see where the ground lights are. And the whole purpose is for the engineer to be able to see the ground. But So that would be there. And then I also want to do my screws to finish off the circuit from the side frame to the, f the frame of the truck to the frame of the locomotive. I need to do a little research as to where the body sits or the shell sits to make sure I don't interfere. So we'll be back. All right, on the F7s, I had plenty of room to do it on both sides. On the GP7, the side walkways really come over top of the entire side of the frame. So the only place I could do it would be where the truck actually mounts. And I'm not comfortable. I want to do that. I guess I could grind it flush on the bottom. I just don't want to weaken that. It'd probably be fine. Um, so I may just run a black wire from that side frame up or just by at least tying the front side frame down, you know, you've got that one tied in and um, so you're only missing the, if that does get dirty, you're only missing the left hand side of one truck. So you definitely have six out of eight in great contact. Um, I don't know, I'll have to give that some thought. Um, but in the meantime, let's drill the front one and we can tap that as well. I forget what the recommended size is for a 256 screw. Uh, it was one I don't typically stock, but I do have a 1 16th, which is very close to what's supposed to be. So I'm just going to do it right in the middle of the frame. Or close to the middle. So <clears throat> we need to remove the paint so it makes good contact, but there's a little bit of a casting bubble there, so I will knock that down first. sure that where our screw head comes down it'll have clean contact with the frame. I'll take the burr off the back. All right. Somewhere floating around here I have a tap. <clears throat> Just a T-handle with a 256 tap. And ideally you'd do this perfectly square. I guess you could use a hand tap, I think, so I don't know if you'd want to do this in a drill tap press or not, but I've had no with the white metal I've had no problems using it by hand. It kind of centers along however your pilot hole was drilled. And some materials like a blind hole you'd have to keep backing it out and clearing the threads, but since this hole goes all the way through, not a problem. Works great on plastic too to set different parts. Spin, try and find a 256 screw that has threads all the way up to the head. I don't know if I have any of those. Thank you. 
thread that one all the way down and then we'll just cut it flush with the Dremel. itself. Good. Okay, I've got a cup full of probably number eight lead shot. Two cups. I've got my casting resin. So I'm going to mix, it, mix up a small amount, and what I've done to prepare, you can see, is with some styrene, I've just super glued some pieces to basically close out the uh, cavity in the fuel tank so that the resin doesn't find its way out. It's not going to take very much. But I usually make a little extra. Let's make sure that that's the same amount of each type. recommend that you scrape the sides and what I usually do is pour it back from one cup to another at least once or twice that way a little bit more likely to get an even mix scrape the edges seconds of continuous mixing. lead shot. Then finish the pour. I'll put a little back in here just to fill that up. should do it. <clears throat> yeah, so as usual, made way too much <laughs> resin, but... It should only take about 5-10 minutes to cure, so we'll be back. Alright, that's just about set up. Still a little tacky, but you really can't see the lead shot very much anymore. Got a couple voids in the bottom, but that'll all lock into the profile of those uh, former motor mount holes. And then I'll have a nice flat area to uh, mount the motor. 
also finished soldering leads to the other sides of the truck. So now I've got all four completed. We're just about done with the frame modifications. So I think all that's left now is I've cleaned up the two areas here and I've got my LEDs prepped. I've soldered a blue which is the positive uh, on the DCC NMRA standards and a green which is the negative for one of the functions and purple which is the negative for the other function. So these are very very small surface mount LEDs and I've just simply don't know if you can see it or not right here and here just tapped a small hole through about a 1 16th hole and with my Dremel I widened them out at the bottom so the light will spread a little bit more evenly over the truck. So now Clean that up one more time with some alcohol. Make sure everything's clean. So now I'll just use some thin CA to glue those right to the frame. Tell you, this thin CA is so dangerous. <clears throat> zoom in on the work. Hopefully my hands won't get in the way. Inevitably they will. Turn it over and make sure I mostly got it coming out of the opening. Really not paying attention too much to which side the green and purple are on because they're both on together. I simply could put them all on the same function wire if I chose to. Sure we're at least reasonably centered. I don't know if it'll focus on that at all or not, but then you can see maybe just a little yellow lens of the LED. So those are the ground lights. I think that wraps up all the assembly and prep on the frame, so we might be able to start reassembling. Reassembling the trucks, and then that'll give the resin some time to set before we attempt to mount the motor. Again, all of this meaningful to do now simply because I'm waiting for the primer, um, enamel primer on the shell to cure, which could take another week, so who knows? We'll just keep moving ahead on the frame assembly. One thing I will do before I assemble the rest of the powertrain and uh, reinstall the trucks is I'm just going to check these LEDs to make sure. I checked them after I soldered them. I'll check them again now that they're mounted just to make sure that they work. So I've set my multimeter um, just for continuity testing and the slight amount of energy that comes through that generally is pretty good for testing LEDs. And see that or not. That one's good. That one's good. 
So we're all set. All right, using a toothbrush and some rubbing alcohol, I've cleaned all of the uh, truck assemblies. So now I can reassemble those. While I'm doing that, might as well just check. Might as well check everything for wheel gauge. Alright, they're all good. Also checking for split. Gears. I thought I saw one. But just gently rotating them. I can't get either I can't get any of them. There we are. Yeah, that sure looks like a split. It's solidly in there, so I'm not going to monkey with it because um, it's not it's not spinning freely. That half shaft is still attached. So, all right, we'll start reassembling. a small piece of 0.06 styrene I shimmed up the motor off of the resin casting that I had done and set that in a, a bed of silicone caulk I had to trim you can see underneath that flywheel just gently uh, with a uh, chisel point exacto knife blade cleaned out the basically the edge of the resin which kind of lips up. It's very important to try and get the motor centered both uh, in both directions. Make sure your center line of your motor shaft is almost spot on with the uh, where the worm drives are going to go. And then obviously it needs to be side to side so that fits in the shell. While I was waiting for the silicone to dry I converted the linkage on the universal joints um, on the worms rather to the Northwest short lines in, uh, rather than the uh, Athern stock ones and I'll need to do that on the uh, ends of the flywheels as well so that's the next step but I, I should have done that before I mounted the motor but now that it's uh, fully set up I can come back in and do that then I can attach the linkage you have to uh, with the Northwest short lines you've got these what they call kind of a dog bone Universal and you, the one like uh, the one end is set. The other end you've got to trim and force press a another end on it to get it to the right length. So that's a little bit uh, tricky. But once I do that, then I can temporarily, I think, install the decoder to at least get the 
confirm that the motor polarity is correct for the direction of the locomotive. They give you two different diameter universal joint ends, one for the two mil, I think a two millimeter shaft, which is the Athern, and then the Northwest Short Lines motor has a slightly smaller diameter um, opening on the back of the universal joint. So the, you use the larger ones go on the end of the worms and the finer ones go on the end of the motor shaft itself. It is definitely important on these, there's a little slot and I have a file that just happens to be just slightly smaller. Definitely important to uh, clean those surfaces, remove all the burrs and flash and then I take the universal shaft itself and I'll insert it in both both directions, both sides to make sure that there's no resistance and just a quick uh, pass of the file and now that, that one's good. I usually run some folded up 400 grit sandpaper through it too just to make sure it's nice and smooth. And then reconfirm that it's still free. Seems like there's a slight grab in there, so I'm going to run that through the sandpaper again. There we go. As I said, I should have done this before I put the motor in, but should be able to do it. I've formed all the Canon and Company grills and fan blades and um, cut everything off the sprue. I've also soaked it all in just a small amount of dishwashing liquid and warm water. So these are going to set aside to dry and what I do to paint these is I have a piece of uh, blue painters tape reversed onto a piece of plywood and I'll stick the various pieces on there to be able to airbrush them. Um, even then you got to be really careful uh, so that you don't blow them all over the uh, workbench and the fans what I did on the F7s is the fans, uh, the blades will get painted a uh, silver or aluminum color, so those will get painted separately. The uh, All the other parts get painted the same color as the body, so that'll be enchantment blue. I will do that. This uh, The GP7 uh, is going to take uh, two coats usually, so I'll, I'll do the fan blades and all of those items uh, when I do the second coat, and I'll, I'll give them a fine coat let that sit for about 10 minutes and then hit them again real quick and that seems to work okay so I will set these aside uh, let them keep drying and then I will mix up some enchantment blue paint and we'll uh, put the first coat on the GP7 shell I already had my respirator on when I realized I almost for a second time forgot to mask the headlight lenses. Uh, again, this model was assembled previously and the headlight lenses were fully installed. So what I've done is put a little bit of, let's see if I can get that in the picture, a little bit of silicone caulk on a paper towel and I'm just gonna put a dab of that on each headlight and then that'll peel off after I'm done painting. Almost forgot. I don't know if I'm going to be able to film this or not. Probably not, but pointing out that almost forgot again. All right. By the time that, by the time I'm done, done mixing the paint, that silicone should be at least hard enough to uh, not move around made a feeble attempt to try and film while I painted and didn't work out very well so here's the finished product actually ended up getting a, about two coats on it it's just how much I had in the cup on the airbrush and uh, it seemed to be going pretty well so I just kept on uh, switching it around and letting one side dry while I worked on the other side or a different spot which is how I've done it before so yeah that primer probably sat for three weeks maybe almost a month probably could have done it a week or two earlier um, but just got tied up doing some other things so I was uh, satisfied at least that the primer was fully cured so while that dries like I said I've got the uh, fan parts 
set up and drying so when I do the second coat of uh, paint on this I will uh, paint those fan parts as well because again you can't paint them the fans have to go in there and they get an aluminum color so you can't paint them all at the same time or else you lose that uh, aluminum color we'll have to come back in and paint the sills the uh, yellow and then we'll be ready for a gloss coat to prep for details so while all that's happening I'll work on the trucks I'll add the uh, air pipes between the brake cylinders and add the speed recorder at the appropriate uh, journal bearing and we'll go from there so it's been a while so probably time that I pull this together into some semblance of a video and in an effort to keep things moving I've been switching between the shell and the chassis uh, just in terms of the various steps of the project so now that I'm waiting for the shell to dry I'll come back and show you what I had done just before that um, on the chassis and motor install so as I think I mentioned previously, let me see if I can find it. Uh, I don't know what I did with it, but um, I think I showed previously how this was the first decoder install I did. And in order to kind of create a shelf above the stock Atherin motor, I had used a piece of styrene. And I think, as I also noted, that was insufficient in terms of structural integrity and uh, started to bend and just didn't provide the uh, outcome I was looking for so what I used to do after that I evolved into super gluing a piece of copper to a piece of styrene uh, for two reasons one I could, that added some rigidity and two uh, rather than having wires run from one end of the locomotive to the other it allows me to put screws in my I didn't do that with the copper that was laminated to the styrene because it wasn't thick enough uh, that I would just solder um, so that that had some challenges too so what what I've been doing or this is the first time I've tried is actually using a piece of bar um, brass that is narrow enough to fit in the shell but it's thick enough to be able to tap and thread for screws and you can see there I've soldered the red wire to the truck assembly itself and then that is fastened to the brass with a threaded tapped 256 screw. The reason for doing that is that way if I need to remove the trucks for service or any kind of maintenance all I have to do is unscrew that um, and I can totally release the truck um, and that wire. Uh, it's just a, it's a way to avoid having to unsolder on the trucks because if you do that too many times uh, it starts to melt the internal plastic components. So uh, the other nice thing that the brass does is adds a decent amount of weight to the locomotive so that's another benefit and then the third piece is it actually uh, it's thick enough to to take the screw and threads but it also serves to conduct all the way to the back a second mechanism same same operation um, so basically it just creates a, a connective circuit and so you can see tucked underneath the speaker there's another screw and this speaker is just sitting on a piece of foam uh, double-sided tape this is an iPhone 4 speaker that I trimmed the end off of and then re-glued a piece of styrene to seal that end of the the speaker I don't know if that actually does anything down there because it's full of a piece of foam so I don't know if it's part of a sound reverberation chamber or if it serves any purpose or not so I sealed it uh, with styrene and uh, styrene cement just to make sure that I wasn't allowing any uh, sound to escape and so far I've tested it sounds pretty good um, and I've started to do all Use the other install tape to wrap around the brass bar stock just to hold the wires down you can see the two thousand ohm resistors for my two ground lights there's the other side and what I ended up doing I'll turn this around so the screw here is for the other side truck uh, attachment same situation instead of using the uh, brass bar I'm using the frame of the locomotive for the black um, basically the ground I guess and the, the red the bar is the positive up here I, I did not do a set screw back here although you can possibly see here's the wire coming up because there was just no place to put a screw 
that wouldn't either interfere with the truck turning movement or the side walkways. So that just comes up and I don't know if you can see because of the colors here. Right there, I just spliced another black wire and that runs all the way up underneath and then down. So both trucks essentially are attached at this point. So that eliminates the chance for that uh, just physical contact surface on the top, the top of the truck bolster to the frame. If that gets any oil or grease on it, um, it doesn't always conduct properly. So that eliminates that whole uh, possibility. So this is a, a modification I've made. So uh, it started with the F7s where I started doing that, um, connecting the black wire. Uh, and this is the first one I've done this way connecting the red wire as I as you saw before uh, when I started on this one this these were still connected to each other but just by a, a single wire uh, this makes the wire a lot shorter um, and using a thin stranded wire using a thin stranded wire just in a little loop really just does not restrict the uh, the motion of the truck at all so it creates I think a better uh, operation both mechanically as well as uh, electrically. So that's where we are. Um, that's what I ended up doing is attaching this with just a piece of foam um, double-sided tape which allows it to move around a little. Um, there's actually a, also a, a thin piece of uh, I think 0.06 styrene uh, under there as well just to make sure I had enough space above the flywheels. Um, so it flexes a little bit, which isn't too bad. Um, I think it's actually a positive thing. It just gives it a little bit of uh, flexibility. But um, yeah, that added a decent amount of weight. So we had already poured the shot into the resin. Now we've added some additional weight. Um, so overall, I think I'm going to move to this uh, approach. Again, I think I'm done for now doing Ather and Blue Box because this is my last one that needed to be redone. Uh, I do have the bar stock comes long enough that you can do you'd be able to do two gp7s and i ran them all the way out intentionally because what i intend to do is you've got a piece of foam tape here is i'm going to put a piece of uh, brass tubing up here and i'm going to try to see if i can get the headlights set up so that just like some of the more modern uh, commercially available locomotives everything is on the chassis and there's no wires going up into the body and that way you can pull the shell off and have no wires connected to it whatsoever. So I'm going to try and do that, which is why I did that with the speaker. This, you know, I had been mounting speakers up in here with some double-sided tape or silicone. But again, then you pull the shell off, you've got the speaker wires, and it's just when you put it back together, you've got these long wires that you know, could go anywhere. But when you've got everything attached to the chassis, you can really tape everything down and make it nice and neat so the shell can come on and off very easily. Uh, without any uh, chance of, of crimping or bending wires. So that's where we are on the decoder install. Just really need to put the headlights on and uh, then finish up taping down the wires. Uh, you can see I've got my blue and white for the front headlight and I've got yellow for the back and then this is just a gray wire. I didn't have any blue wire. I'll have to pick that up. This is just coming back from the common blue. So this common blue serving both of the LED ground lights and the resistors I put on both of those I put on the negative side and so I just really have the two headlights to install and the wires are already ready to go. So it's just a matter of mounting a brass tube within, I don't know if, I think I'm going to do incandescence just because I have some. I've been using 16 volt incandescence and in four and a half years, knock on wood, I haven't actually burned one out yet. So uh, again, the decoder is probably putting out 12 or 13 volts uh, DC. So using a heavier 16 volt um, light uh, seems to work really well. And that was a recommendation from uh, one of the guys at the hobby shop. So thanks Dave for that advice. That's worked out very well over the last four years. And, and I still like the illumination quality of incandescence uh, obviously really challenging to use those for ground lights so those are surface mounted LEDs but um, yeah I'm probably gonna work uh, continue working at least on this one with uh, incandescence uh, on some previous locomotives I have used LED headlights so I'm not not really against them it's just in this case I think I'm gonna stick with the incandescence uh, that were in there All right, so. so that's it for now I will uh, post this 
give everybody a chance to see what I've been doing since it's been about a month. And uh, we'll do that and we'll keep working.